You know those uh, power lines you see stretching across the landscape, mm -hmm. sometimes on those huge towers, sometimes just on poles down the street? Yeah, the really thin ones. Exactly. They look so, well, unassuming. But they carry so much power. Mm -hmm. How does that even work? And, you know, what's really going on with the electricity that actually flows into our homes? Mm. Welcome to The Deep Dive. We're the show that unpacks the fascinating why behind everyday things. And today, we are definitely taking a deep dive into electricity, specifically voltage. Mm. Why do we use such high voltage? What does that mean for the power you use every day? And how does it get all the way from, say, a power plant to your phone charger? It's a great topic. It often feels a bit like magic, doesn't it? It really does. But once you grasp a few core ideas, it actually becomes, well, incredibly clear. And we'll be using insights from Jun Byung-shil's book, Jejin Chobo Jori Majongi. It's a fantastic source because it explains these things really accessibly, sort of eye level, you know, for anyone who's curious. Absolutely. So our mission today, let's demystify voltage, current, power, even resistance. We'll show you how it's all carefully balanced to get electricity to you safely and uh, efficiently. Sounds good. Okay, let's unpack this. First things first, why? Why the super high voltage on power lines? It feels kind of risky, almost counterintuitive. It's a really good question to start with, and the book uses a great analogy. Think about a water pipe. Okay, like plumbing. Exactly. If you want to push more water through the same pipe, what's the easiest way? Increase the pressure. Bingo. Higher pressure more water flows at the other end. Ah, uh, okay. So if we think about electricity the same way, voltage is the pressure in the wire. Precisely. Voltage is that electrical pressure. And the flow of electricity. Mm -hmm. That's current. Is that right? You got it. That flow is current, and we measure it in amps or amps. Okay. Voltage, current. And when that electricity is actually doing something useful, like lighting a bulb or charging your laptop, that's electric power. Got it. Power is the work being done. So how does this link back to those thin power lines? Well, here's the key connection. Electric power is calculated simply by multiplying voltage and current. Ah, the formula. So power in watts, voltage V, current A. Exactly. And knowing this lets us see the trade-offs. Okay, so give me an example, like from the book. Sure. Let's say you have something using 200 volts and one amp flows through it. The power is 200 times one. So 200 watts. It's awesome. Or clip it around. If you have a 200 volt heater that uses a thousand watts of power, mm -hmm. how much current does it draw? Uh, okay, power divided by voltage. A thousand watts divided by 200 volts. That's five amps. Perfect. See, you're doing the math already. Okay, but then here's the really interesting bit, right? What happens if you want to send the same amount of power, but you change the voltage? This feels important for the high voltage question. It's crucial. The book gives us a really clear example. Let's imagine we need to transmit 2000 watts of power. Okay, 2000 watts. If we send it at 100 volts, remember, power equals voltage x current. We need 20 amps of current. 2000 W at 100 V equals 20 A. Right, 20 amps. That sounds like a lot. Now, what if we double the voltage to 200 volts? You know, 2000 W divided by 200 V, that's 10 amps, half the current. Exactly. Now, let's really ramp it up. What if we send those same 2000 watts at 1000 volts? Wow, OK. 2000 W divided by 1000 V, that's only 2 amps. See the pattern. For the exact same amount of power delivered, if you dramatically increase the voltage, the current needed actually decreases just as dramatically. Ah, so that's why those big transmission lines carrying maybe 22,900 volts or even way more can be relatively thin. Precisely. They're operating at super high voltages, so the actual current, the flow of electrons through the wire, is much lower than you'd think for the huge amount of power they're transmitting. Mind blown. Okay. Well, wait, there's another piece to this puzzle, a really important one. Electrical resistance. Oh, yes. Resistance. The villain, right. Yeah. Huh. Well, sort of. Even the best copper wires aren't perfect. They have some natural resistance measured in ohms symbol. It basically um, interferes with the flow of electricity. It hinders it. And what does that resistance do? Does it just slow things down? Worse, it causes power loss. The energy fighting against that resistance turns into heat. Wasted energy. Okay, so resistance is bad for efficiency. How does voltage play into that? This is where it gets really fascinating. Our source shows the calculation. Let's use that same 2000W example and imagine the wire has a resistance of just one ohm. Okay, one ohm resistance sending 2000 watts. Remember at 100 volts, we needed 20 amps. The power loss in that wire would be 400 watts. 400 watts, just lost his heat. That's like 20% of the power. Yep. Now remember at 200 volts, we only needed 10 amps. The power loss drops to 100 watts. You better, 
Much better, only 5% loss. But now remember, at the 1,000 volts, we only needed 2 amps. Guess the power loss. Uh, it's got to be way lower. Maybe 20 watts? Even better, only 4 watts. 4. Down from 400, that's incredible. It really is. Here's the takeaway. Increase the voltage 10 times, the current drops to 1 tenth. But the power loss decreases by 100 times. 100 times, wow. That massive reduction in wasted energy is why we use high voltage for transmission. It means huge economic savings and much, much higher efficiency getting power over long distances. Okay, that completely explains the why of high voltage. It's all about minimizing that wasteful power loss due to resistance. Exactly, which brings us to the actual journey electricity takes. Right, from the power plant. Yeah through all those wires. Right. What's that process called again? It's generally called power transmission and electric power distribution, getting it generated, then sending it out, and finally distributing it to users. And the book mentions Korea's history here, right? Something about changing voltages. Yes, a really interesting point. Between 1973 and 2005, Korea undertook this massive project to upgrade its standard household voltage from 110 volts up to 220 volts. Doubling the voltage. Wow. Was that difficult? Extremely. Think about changing every outlet, potentially affecting every appliance in the country. But they managed it incredibly smoothly. It's actually seen globally as, uh, well, a rare success story for such huge infrastructure change. Why did they do it? Was 110V not enough? Well, electricity demand was just soaring. The existing wires in buildings inside the walls couldn't handle the increasing load at 110V without overheating or needing replacement, which would have been astronomically expensive. Ah, so instead of replacing all the wires. They doubled the voltage. Just like our water pipe analogy doubled the pressure, you can get twice the power through the same pipe, or in this case, the same wires. It was a brilliant move for efficiency and meeting demand. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So let's trace that path quickly. Where does it start? Okay, so it's generated at a power plant, maybe around 22,000 volts, 22 kilovolts or kvs. Still pretty high. Oh, yeah. But then right there at the plant substation, it gets stepped up way up to like 345 kilov or even 765 kilov for long distance travel on those huge transmission towers you see crossing the countryside. To minimize that power loss we talked about. Exactly. Then as it gets closer to towns and cities, it starts getting stepped down. Like a series of steps. Kind of. Big factories might take it at, say, 154 kV. Apartment buildings or large complexes might get a feed at 22.9 kV. Still way too high for my toaster. Right. So the final step happens usually right near your house on a utility pole. There's a transformer up there, sometimes called a pole pig informally, that steps it down one last time. To the familiar 220 volts or maybe 380 volts for some applications, that comes into our homes. Precisely. That's the end of the transmission and distribution journey. Okay, so we've firmly established high voltage is fantastic for efficiency, especially over long distances. It cuts down waste dramatically. But that leads to another question. If higher is so much better for efficiency, why don't we just use like super high voltage for everything? Why stop at 220V for homes? Is higher always better? Ah, an excellent point. No, it's definitely not always better. High voltage might be efficient, but it comes with its own set of challenges and, frankly, dangers. Well, think about the water pipe analogy again. If you increase the pressure too much, what happens? Oh, well, pipes could burst, fittings could leak, it gets harder to handle safely. Exactly. It's similar with electricity. Very high voltages dramatically increase the risk of severe electric shock. Plus, you need much, much better insulation, thicker, more specialized materials to contain it safely. That gets very expensive and bulky, especially for everyday wiring and appliances. Ah, okay. So it's not just about the electrical math. It's about practicality, safety, cost. Precisely. Finding the right voltage for a country or a specific application is a complex balancing act. It involves technology limits, economics, safety standards, reliability needs, even social agreement on what's acceptable. Which explains why different countries landed on different standards, right? Absolutely. You see places like the UK, Germany, most of Europe using voltages in the 200 to 250 volt range. While the US, Japan, Taiwan, they tend to use around 110 or 120 volts. Right. And it's not necessarily because one is technically superior overall. These standards often evolved based on historical decisions, the state of technology at the time, economic factors, all sorts of things. So for you listening, if you travel internationally, 
That's why you sometimes need adapters. Exactly. But the good news is many modern electronics, especially things like laptop chargers or phone chargers, are designed to be free voltage. What does that mean, free voltage? It just means the device has internal circuitry that can automatically adapt to a wide range of input voltages, maybe from 100V all the way up to 240V. It makes them super convenient for travel. But not everything is like that. Definitely not. Things with heating elements like hair dryers or travel kettles often draw a lot more power and might be fixed to a specific voltage. So always, always check the label on your device before plugging it in overseas. Look for that input, 100, 240V marking or something similar. Good practical advice. Always check the label. Wow, what a journey we took today. We started just wondering about those thin power lines. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen this, well, elegant interplay between voltage pushing, current flowing, and resistance trying to hold it back. And how cranking up that voltage push dramatically cuts down the energy wasted fighting resistance. That's the key to efficient power transmission. Yeah, and we learned about Korea's big voltage upgrade, a real world example of balancing efficiency with practicality. Right, it shows that the final voltage we use isn't just a number pulled out of thin air. It's a carefully considered choice involving safety, cost, technology, mm -hmm a whole system designed to work. It really makes you appreciate the complexity behind just flipping a switch or plugging something in. We so often take it for granted. Absolutely. This whole system from those giant power plants generating immense energy down through all the transmission lines and transformers right to the outlet in your wall, it's an incredible feat of engineering. Constantly balancing huge power with safety and making sure it gets where it needs to go without losing too much along the way. So, as you go about your day, maybe plugging in your phone or making coffee, here's something to think about. What other essential systems in our daily lives rely on a similar, maybe hidden balance? A trade-off between efficiency, safety, cost, and practicality that we just don't normally see. Mm, that's a good one. Something for you to mull over or maybe even explore on your own. 